The objective was clear. Develop an integrated strategy for improving children's behavioral health in the state of Georgia. The state government had set up the Interagency Directors Team, or IDT, to fundamentally transform the coordination of services for children's behavioral health. The team was comprised of members from different agencies, service providers, and stakeholder groups, including education, juvenile justice, public health, community health, and child and family services. They'd been meeting for over a year without making the progress that they really wanted. It was at this point that they reached out for some expertise to help them. Working with the Centers of Excellence for Children's Behavioral Health at the Georgia Health Policy Center, the team developed their systems thinking skills. Using these thinking skills, they were able to develop a collective vision of success. This was an operational picture that they could use to think about how their strategies would work. Ultimately, they turned this picture into a strategy map. Based on a series of interviews with IDT members, we developed a map of the children's behavioral health system. This systems map is a set of understanding about how we think that different pieces of the system fit together to generate the causes and the solutions that we're looking for. The map ultimately pointed out that there was a problem, a potential area of concern where funding and rewards were set up in such a way that it might not produce the systemic collaboration that people were looking for. The system had evolved to perpetuate piecemeal coordination of services or disintegrated services. The fundamental goal that people were trying to figure out and understand was how to keep children more in the community. But if you look at it, they were in two different major areas. They were either in community, in a variety of different settings, or in institutions. Think about how you could have children accumulating in foster families as opposed to being in their regular families. They could move down into foster families. They could also move from the community into institutions. They could move into either health institutions or into corrections institutions. It was this fundamental disparate way that children were being served in the system that could lead to a disintegration or uncoordination of services. Not surprisingly, it had evolved to become a very service-centric or push diagram. Organizations had specific services, such as counseling, education, that they were dutifully providing or pushing to qualified children and their families. In the first systems map, it was easy to see how, with limited funding, the various stakeholder groups would end up competing for ever-shrinking resources. Children were pulled from one place in the system and pushed to somewhere else, although there seemed little improvement in their long-term development trajectory. The main result was often that someone else became responsible. And once you were responsible for someone, you'd ask for more resources to take care of them. It was definitely antithetical to collaboration. No admonition to work together was going to work when approaching from a provider-centric stance. After the IDT increased their systems thinking capacity, they were able to put aside the first map and to think about building an emerging vision of sustainability. They were able to think about how the system might not be well set up if you pushed services, but rather created a different vision. What would happen if you could think about maximizing children's behavioral health in a way that they grew up to be the types of adults that we all wanted to see? which means that they could hold a job, or drive a car, or live on their own, if capable of doing so. Starting with a stock of adults living this maximized quality of life, they were able to develop a pipeline, or a chain, that showed how children, as they grew older, can either be on track or off track. The goal, keep children on track as much as possible, and if they fell off track, get them back on track as needed. Co-building this map helped the team visualize the system in an alternate approach that was easier to mentally simulate and more visceral. One collective insight they had was that the further to the right, as children aged into adulthood, the symptoms that were occurring were much more problematic and costly. Things like incarceration, homelessness, substance abuse, and crime. There was little incentive in the system to spend money and resources upstream when all of the symptoms that were the most costly were downstream. Using the map, they were able to develop a coordinated strategy where they could all work together at funding and moving investments upstream. Now I see how we can focus on a child at each stage of their development and think about what they need, and how we can each coordinate our resources to fulfilling that need. This map will be the foundation of our strategy, declared one of the team's leaders. Even two years later, the team uses a laminated version of this map when they're thinking about strategy. They use it to communicate to health commissioners, 
They use it to communicate to stakeholder groups. They use it in order to think about how well their strategy is being implemented and how they might change it. It is a dynamic picture that helps them to guide strategy. Using systems thinking helps groups move into a space of an accelerated learning where they reframe the goal. In this case, they moved up to the 30,000 foot view and were able to see the larger whole of the system that they were trying to change. This helped them move from inaction to action. By seeing how they were focusing on different parts of the system in ways that were ineffective, they were able to move into a more collaborative space. The good news is that such population management systems maps can be applied to a variety of different situations, such as violence, chronic disease, or obesity. And it can also be applied to non-traditional health issues, such as education or employment. A modification of the on-track, off-track map can be applied to risk and protective factors. We developed such a map in conjunction with the CDC, the National Network of Public Health Institutes, and the Georgia Health Policy Center. The map was developed to better understand how to prevent violence. Similar to the IDT map, there was an aging chain where children could age into youth and age into adults. Along the way, they could develop risk factors for violence. A few risk factors are substance abuse, mental health, including depression in the family, social isolation, toxic stress, and community violence. As they age, these risk factors move from causing people to being likely victims of violence to becoming perpetrators. This creates powerful reinforcing feedback loops often referred to as vicious cycles. Children who have experienced violence become adults who create violence, who then lead to more children experiencing violence. The good news is that there are also protective factors can move along with children as they age. Such protective factors will keep them from being victims or committing violence. Such protective factors include education and employment. The maps are part of a toolkit that allows stakeholders across the community health system and public social system to gather together and to ask questions like, how can we reduce some of the risk factors that are most prevalent in our community? Where are places where we can work to increase protective factors? How can we work together in ways to communicate and engage others in solving and working on these problems? So here's how you can build these types of maps. One type of map I refer to as a state-by-state -state map. State-to-state -state map is something similar to the IDT map, where individuals can age up and simultaneously go back and forth between states during an age category. So here's how you would do it. You'd find some population health metric, let's say obesity or, or, or weight, and then look at an age range. And within an age range, classify individuals as being in the healthy weight bucket or stock, or the unhealthy weight or obese stock. Think about how they can flow into and out of those stocks. Then you can think about moving them up to the next age range. Once you've laid out the chain, you can then start asking questions. Pick a stock of most importance. What's happening there? Is it going up, going down? Why? Then you can start thinking about investments and opportunities for intervening. Can you intervene more upstream and prevent the state from getting worse as it moves downstream? Is there opportunities for collaboration that may not be there where people are focusing on parts of the stream in different places with different emphasis? Just use the map to start asking questions about where you would put resources and how you would move forward. It's a great way to get people, again, focusing on the problem instead of focusing on what they're doing. Another type of map I frequently use is an attribute chain map, very much like the violence prevention map where we had risk and protective factors aging up or is that attributes that followed a person as they aged. So, for example, if I was going to build one of those, I would find what's the issue or what's the attribute I most want to understand and think about maybe an age in which it starts to accumulate. So for example, when children are young, they develop some skills. As they age up, those skills move with them. I would start asking questions on how can I make sure that you know, at the age I'm trying to intervene, what is happening in terms of the ability to build those skills or to influence that attribute? How does the attribute change over time? Does it actually accumulate or is there a loss of it? And think about, again, as it moves forward. This gives you an opportunity to think about managing a system. Again, because it's often the case where you want an attribute later on that you really need to invest in earlier upstream. How do you all work together, again, to focus upstream resources to develop that attribute? And there are a host of other questions you can ask with this kind of map. I hope you see that the types of maps we've just explored can be useful in some of the very important situations that you're trying to work on. Many groups that I've facilitated have found that these maps have led to some creative and unexpected insights. Often they find that where they've been applying resources are the more obvious or more symptomatic, problematic areas, and that there's leverage in applying resources elsewhere. 
These maps can increase your team's ability to engage in the tough challenges often pushed beneath the surface. By building a shared picture of the assumptions you're using to solve problems, you're able to accelerate and create an agile learning approach and develop the shared leadership mindset you need. You can start using these maps right away, and I hope you do.